Academically on that track, I uh, did some interning at the Smithsonian uh, Marine Station up in Fort Pierce, and uh, behind me is this uh, underwater oasis. This is a picture I just recently took of their uh, model coral reef eco uh, exhibit. It's a 3,000 gallon tank. Um, it's got a wide variety of hard and soft corals from uh, Diploria, the brain coral, the millipora, the fire coral, acropora, uh, palmata, and cervicornis, the, the staghorn coral, Sponges, there's uh, uh, Gorgonian, which is uh, sea fans and um, sea whips, and <clears throat> more specifically, Zoxanthellae, which are in there in great abundance. You can't see them. My presentation is on Zoxanthellae, um, more specifically, the Zoxanthellae that are found only within the coral tissue. So, my presentation topics uh, what are Zoxanthellae? Uh, where do they live? Uh, why are they important? And should you care about zooxanthellae. So, uh, to start, what are zooxanthellae? Uh, zooxanthellae uh, that are found in coral disease are photosynthetic dinoflagellates uh, of the phylum Phanoflagellata. Um, they all have chloroplasts, meaning they, uh, they work with photosynthesis, creating uh, nutrition from sun energy to chemical energy. Uh, they are symbionts of radioarions and cymodinium. Uh, there are vast differences in the pigmentation uh, giving a wide variety of colors to the corals. So the zooxanthellae that embed themselves within the tissue of the corals actually provide the very beautiful, uh, sometimes very beautiful coloration that the corals have. So to keep things straight, um, zooxanthellae uh, can be found within giant clams and anemones, but I'm not really speaking about them. Uh, they also can be found in corals. Uh, they also can be uh, free uh, living and pelagic. Now what happens is uh, <clears throat> when a zooxanthellae is free living and pelagic, it uh, comes through the water and, and gets attached to one of the tentacles, gets drawn into the mouth, the coral then ingests them, uh, brings them to the gastrodermal layer and embeds them within the gastrodermis and uses them as it employs them. As a, uh, as a photosynthesizing algae. Uh, here's a closer view of one of the tentacles, uh, which shows the, uh, the epidermis as the outer layer, the meso, the middle glia, mesoglia, the middle layer, the gastrodermis, which is where the zooxanthellae are housed, and then the, uh, the space below that, which is the cilenteron. <coughs> now, zooxanthellae, uh, they convert energy into chemical energy. Uh, photosynthesis is, uh, results in the production of sugar, glucose. Um, the symbionts allows for survival when oxygen-rich water flows slow down. What that means is that 
most animals, they need to have a, uh, a current of, of fresh oxygen, uh, oxygen-rich water that flows in that provides them with their oxygen. Now, this, this unique relationship between these two, uh, photosynthesis uh, uptakes carbon dioxide, produces oxygen as a byproduct, so the two are able to have access to this readily available supply of oxygen. So when the oxygen levels slow down uh, and decrease in their environment, they're able to survive better than many other organisms. Um, so generally, uh, zooxanthellae are net consumers of CO2. Like I just said, they, they take up carbon dioxide and then they are producers of oxygen because as a byproduct, they create oxygen. Here is a representation of the zooxanthellae itself within a cell. So sunlight's gonna come in and interact with the chloroplast, uh, causing uh, photosynthesis to occur, which is the uptake of CO2 and the output of oxygen, which can then feed the mitochondria of the cell of the zooxanthellae individually, as well as feeding oxygen to the mitochondria of the coral tissue itself. Now, the main product of photosynthesis is the glucose, or sugar, which is then translocated into the cytoplasm of the coral itself. Um, now, this all occurs during sunlight hours when photosynthesis is actually happening at night. That is not the case, so the corals can augment that by feeding, by extending the tentacles, uh, catching prey, digesting those organisms, <coughs> and breaking them into carbohydrates, further broken into amino acids, which can then go to protein uh, for building uh, calcium, or also for building nitrates and phosphates, which are essentially fertilizers. So the corals can effectively fertilize their symbiotic buddies. Works out rather well. Here is another representation of the coral tissue. Above is the seawater, below that is the outer epidermis. Again, the middle mesoglea, the gastrodermis, where the zooxanthellae are housed, the cilentron, the space between the oral tissue and the aboral tissue, and then the gastrodermis, again, the mesoglea, the calioblastic epidermis, and below that, the subcalioblastic space, and finally below that, the corallium. That's the calcium carbonate structure that they produce that the, uh, the colony uses as a substrate. So corals, um, they're animals that have polyps and secrete skeletons, which may be hard or may be soft around their bodies. So the soft body corals, like Gorgonians, sea whips, and sea fans, they have a certain degree of flexibility, as were the hard corals, like the Gloria, brain corals, middle floor, fire corals. They're extremely hard, made of calcium carbonate, and they serve as a basis for reef building. Um, they are by far the uh, dominant benthic organism in uh, low nutrient tropical waters. They're again, they're autotrophic uh, and they're also heterotrophic. So they have the luxury of not depending on one particular food source. Um, <clears throat> now, corals receive zooxanthellae in two ways. Directly from the parent, when the larval is, is sent out into the, uh, into the environment, uh, zooxanthellae can be sent with that larva. Uh, or also the free living pelagic zooxanthellae can then find their way uh, to the corals from the open environment. Whoa, a 20 foot dory, a 15 foot Nemo. Uh oh, this is a, a diorama, an underwater uh, diorama of what happens to uh, materials, to structures that are man-made that make their way to the, to the ocean floor. Um, this is a representation of a World War II-ish uh, ship and uh, <clears throat> this is just to sort of uh, convey how uh, colonization takes place. Um, in, in nature, you're going to find colonization of coralline algae, calcareous green algae, uh, polyps, and sponges, and of course, corals. So this is uh, just a way to <clears throat> bring that to the lecture. Um, so corals provide habitat. There are uh, an unspeakable amount of organisms that uh, corals do provide habitat. These are just a few. They're mostly identifiable, um, mostly uh, vertebrates with the exception of the two shrimp up at the top, but my time is limited. Um, coral bleaching. Uh, stressors provoke coral bleaching and it, uh, it results in a bare coral skeleton. Now, there are many things that cause coral bleaching, some of which are when storms uh, pass through the um, when the storms pass through, uh, hurricanes and storms, they stir up the, the bottom, uh, making uh, the, the, the 
the water extremely uh, turbid and, uh, and light transmission is minimal. So therefore, uh, organisms that rely on photosynthesis uh, generally have a big problem. So there's a hot debate on whether or not the zooxanthellae decide to leave or the corals themselves actually kick the zooxanthellae out. There's some uh, preliminary uh, research that suggests that there's an upregulation of uh, microtubule production, which leads to uh, 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 flagellum, which may indicate that the, uh, the zooxanthellae are preparing to become free living and pelagic once again, and they're ready to leave. Um, so, but coral bleaching is not the uh, end all to be all. Uh, if the, the instance is seven days or less, there is a, uh, a, a strong possibility that the coral itself can recover. Um, if there's some remaining areas of viable coral tissue, the tissue can divide and the colony can, can reestablish. Uh, the other way is for free living uh, pelagic uh, zooxanthellae to take up residency in the coral that is still maintaining um, its life, but, but you know, actively not uh, having any zooxanthellae within its tissue. <clears throat> and uh, the importance of corals, they are extremely in high in productivity, uh, hurricane and storm coastal protection, the tourism industry like scuba diving and snorkeling, potentials for pharmaceuticals, uh, they provide habitat for the basis of the food web from small organisms all the way up to top predators um, that ultimately end up on our menus at restaurants. Example, groupers. There are more, but I can't get into it for lack of time. Zooxanthellae, should you care about zooxanthellae? Well, far be it from me to make up anyone's mind, but if you live near the water, if you enjoy eating seafood and you're pretty happy with the ecosystem being the way that it is and has been for some time, I think you should. So to sum up, all corals are successful because they are endosymbiotic they have endosymbiotic uh, algal living uh, within their tissue that allows them to gain energy from the sun, the zooxanthellae. Um, it is this very process that makes corals uh, and zooxanthellae targets for the environmental stresses such as storms, hurricanes, and there's another subject of nutrient waste runoff from humans uh, or fertilizer that cause eutrophication that we learned about in the class. Uh, zooxanthellae are instrumental in allowing corals to survive and being biological engineers um, and providing habitats for the marine life. <clears throat> These are my references, and for your viewing pleasure. Come on, work. And all the pictures that, that you've seen, I took myself and extrapolated them from video that I took. This is uh, the 3,000 gallon, 3,300 gallon tank that's at the Smithsonian that I mentioned before. There you see an abundance of marine life uh, living um, charismatically along the reef. Angelfish, surgeonfish, sergeant majors, damsels, Jack Dempsey's, uh, along with a tremendous amount of different corals. Um, these are the sea lips and the sea fangs are back there. Up at the top is the Acropora uh, palmata, the elkhorn coral. Um, there's brain coral there, the Diploria. Um, there's anemones see mushrooms, there's, there's, a, there's a, it's teeming with life. And then there's another calm, docile section to it. Um, some fish that still live in the calm section. But there's areas that have high uh, uh, area of current, you know, out in the, in the open ocean, they are considered an oasis, uh, meaning that the, uh, the currents usually are active on one side and not on the other, so fish will uh, orient, orientate themselves accordingly. Um, these are all representations of, of hard coral. There was a tang, a little tang there, um, parietes. And um, you know, it's really just beautiful. And this is a, a nighttime representation. So these are false actinic light that represent moonlight. But you can see the, the coloration that comes out in the animals and, and the corals themselves. Um, that looks like a fungal coral. I can't quite tell from here, but I'm going to pan down here with my camera moments on an extremely beautiful coral, which really showcases how zooxanthellae appear within the coral tissue. Zoom in. It looks professional until you see me go out of focus, but it was the second day I had the camera. Were you actually underwater? Nope. This was at, uh, this was at the actual sea world. I'm, 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 through the power of television, I'm making you think it's all the Smithsonian. 
can see these uh, these, these well illuminated areas here. Those are all these ozone fell giving that uh, that coloration to the corals themselves. And of course, it's nighttime, so the coral is extended itself to uh, to try to capture the animals that are swimming by uh, for consumption. So corals, you know, in my opinion, are just unexampled in nature. They're they're just they're they're an amazing thing. And if you haven't had the chance to you know get in the water and go at least snorkeling, if you can scuba dive scuba dive, you can stay down for you know, extended periods of time and really absorb the beauty uh, that, that nature has, has you know, just worked itself out. In my terms, it's no short of magic. It's just it's an amazing thing to, 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 to see with your own eyes. Um, you know, viewing it on television is, is certainly fine, but doing it in real life, I highly recommend it. Thank you. General information, they are found in Kingdom Animalia, Phylum Mollusca, Class Cephalopoda, Superorder Octodiform, and Order Octopoda. Poda, sorry. All right, some basic facts. They are soft body with a well-developed brain. They are very intelligent. Some think that they are the, the most intelligent invertebrate. Um, they have eyes on each side of their head, um, and the thing is they are completely deaf, like they cannot hear whatsoever. Communication, um, they communicate by changing color, and another thing that they use when they change color is camouflage. They, um, when they change color, it's either they're camouflaging themselves or changing color to communicate with one, one another. Um, and when they are white, they usually turn, I mean, when they are scared, they usually turn white. And we all know the plural for octopus is octopi, and the octo in their name means they have um, eight arms. And I have a video to show you um, about their color change. As you can see, it's white right now, meaning that it's scared. And it's starting to change colors. 
which is very cool for me. Yep. I mentioned before an octopus has eight arms and they are called tentacles and each tentacle has about 240 suction cups to grasp their prey and that's basically a total of nine 1920 suction cups um, they release ink to distract their enemies while they swim away um, and another thing if their arms are cut off they can regenerate the largest octopus is found in the giant Pacific Oh, sorry. In the Pacific, um, it's up to 30 feet long, bit wide, I mean. The smallest octopus is in, it's found in California. And